That's a cool new intro for the best podcast. Oh, that's not authorised. There she is. The beautiful sound. Hare Krishna, welcome back to the Bliss Podcast, episode 22. I'm AJ Rishi Dasa, your host, and I'm here with Birja Prabhu, the founder of the Bhaktivedanta Lives and Sound Society. Hare Krishna Prabhu. It is a great pleasure to be with you today. Hare Ibor, all uh, glories to Prabhupada. Jai Srila Prabhupada. Likewise, it's a great pleasure to be here talking about the Bliss news and the various topics that we do. If you weren't here for the last podcast, on the last podcast, uh, we Krishnafied. We Krishnafied. We testified about Krishna, our, um, our previous experience in Kami life and before coming to Krishna consciousness. And uh, it was a very exciting podcast. So I'm going to link that down in the description below. Or you can just go in on the Expand the Bliss YouTube channel and uh, surf through all of our videos we have there. And you can check out the previous podcasts, including last week's. And I think there's also some other videos on this channel. Along with this channel, we also have the Kick on the Face channel where there's some nice philosophy videos. We have the Facebook page, or the Instagram, the donates. They're all going to be linked in the description of this video. So uh, feel free to check out all of our different platforms that you can reach us on to give your comments, feedback, criticisms, challenges like that. We're open to everything. Anything you'd like to add in this connection, Prabhu? I would like to add that um, we're thankful for our die-hard um, fans and listeners, Jai. just like Harley. Harley is um, um, a very nice devotee from uh, the States. I don't know exactly which state it is, but he's faithfully listening to pretty much all of our podcasts from the beginning. Thank you so much, Harley. He's, he's listening probably even right now. <laughs> Yeah, as we're recording. Yeah, he, he just told me that he usually listens to a class of Srila Prabhupada, Srimad Bhagavatam class, and one of our podcasts, um, pretty much every day in the morning, they go for a ride uh, with his uh, tiny little son, wow. six, six months or seven months old. So the son is listening to the Bhagavatam. What a fortunate... Such a fortunate so. son. Wow. Yeah. That's a wicked combo. Thank you, Ali. Oh... Then um, our uh, another friend is uh, Mr. Christian Liotta, huh? very, very nice devotee, although he doesn't like to be called a devotee, he says, I'm a cheat, I'm not oh. a devotee, I'm a cheat. That's a real devotee. <laughs> so yeah, thank you, uh, Christian, for supporting. Um, he is providing um, the podcast, um, on, he's providing for the, our podcast to be broadcasted on the bus route. So in case you're listening to um, uh, our podcast on Buzzsprout or all these different uh, Spotify's and whatever. Oh, I, it's on Spotify too. I don't even know what kind of, all kinds <laughs> of platforms where people are listening. Okay. So it, thanks to Christian Liotta. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you for Christian for making this uh, broadcast possible to all um, platforms. Because I know personally some people don't like to go on YouTube or well, they like to download the podcast and listen to it in their spare time. So you can't do that on YouTube. The bus bus is a very nice platform. Also, I heard from Bjorn Prabhu. Bjorn Prabhu was Jai. very um, happy that we shared his dream about Krishna. Yes. He felt touched that we actually shared that. It was a very nice dream. Um, it's on the uh, Fake Money podcast a couple of weeks ago. You can check it out. Yeah, so um, this is our tiny little unofficial, official, whatever, spiritual transcendental bliss community Aibu. Aibu. yeah that, was, that dream was a real nectar it's like a new uh, pastime in the krishna book almost you know, really something so um yeah thanks to the the bliss family and um in this connection the bliss news what's happening the bliss news do we have a, a soundtrack for the bliss news yeah i might have to make one with my mouth my own voice in a second if you don't you don't have to because the jingle is here wow Bliss <laughs> new. I don't think I could do that that jingle with my mouth. So thank you for saving me from embarrassment. Um, what happened this week in the bliss news? Well, um, it's corona still, so we're here in the temple, locked down, like everyone else in the whole world. I mean, not in a temple, but everyone else is locked down. And um, yeah, this uh, coronavirus. There's conspiracy theories that it's going to go on until 2022. 
My good. Oh, okay. No, no, no. This uh, this was on the American media, NBC or something like that. They, okay. they said this on the official 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 media, <laughs> Krishna. In twenty twenty two. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So yeah, there's a possibility we're gonna be here for a little while longer. Anyway, it's not so bad. For those who are chanting Hare Krishna, let's you know, just sit indoors, be grab those books, chant. Great, Jai. It's a nice way how to leave your body. Yeah. Fast, Maharaj Parikshit style, seven days, and then just leave. So, um, <laughs> okay, so in bliss news, though, I don't know, is, is there anything that happened substantially, Prabhu? Maybe my memory is escaping me. I... Well, we're considering to uh, move to England. Right. Um, from here, we're, right now we're here in, here in La Linea, the edge of Spain, right on the edge. Yeah. Um, just, uh, we, we, I'm just looking at the, um, uh, Gibraltar rock from the balcony here. I'm just seeing it right now. It's a wonderful. The British Govardhan. <laughs> the Govardhan Hill. So we're thinking that we're gonna relocate, but you know, it's still not sure. But in case you're listening from England, please let us know because we might be more inspired if you're there. Yeah. We're gonna reconnect. We'll have a, a bliss family. Um, reconnection or some new members that we can uh, team up with there. That'd be cool. So yeah, London is a possibility. Aside from that, I don't know if there's too much that's happening in the Bliss News. We've got some projects coming up. Um, some stuff is going to be released. Uh, are we okay? Is it okay to tell them about the, the new book that's going to be printed? Or is that confidential? Which book? Teaching the Lord Buddha. Yeah. Okay, so possibly Teachings of Lord Buddha is going to be coming out very soon. So uh, in a year. In a year. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, this is uh, this is the first teaser for Teachings of Lord Buddha printing. You heard it here first. Okay, so this week on the Bliss Podcast. Oh, one more thing. Oh, so Maitreya Prabhu is working on a new uh, video about love, right? Ah, love. Yes, love, such a nice thing, love. So stick around, we're going to upload and expand the Bliss YouTube. Very soon. So, this week's episode of the Bliss Podcast. Today, um, I bought something special for you, Prabhu. I got inspired. Oh, oh, yeah. I got inspired. Yeah. And uh, I was just browsing the YouTube, carousing the YouTube. So I'm surprised. Yes, as a surprise. Special nectar. I found, um, I found a very uh, enlightened um, man on YouTube. For the recording Yes. Yeah. yeah, we have to check the recording um, because right now there's kind of like um, a, a, a digital catastrophe in the Bliss Temple. We don't. Uh, my my uh, recording devices and apps are all kind of malfunctioning, so we have to be constantly on guard to see um, whether or not it's uh, working properly. In other words, we're very unprofessional. Yes. <laughs> That's, that works because that's the Bliss News jingle. So in Bliss News, uh, we're very unprofessional. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, I found a very enlightened uh, man. And he was talking there about Brahman and spirituality. And I think, you, I think you're going to appreciate it, Babu. So, okay. yeah, let's, uh, let's give it a check. Let's see what you think. It's just people with self-improvement and spiritual growth. And today we're going to be talking about the two levels of reality. Now, if you want to see more videos like this, please remember to subscribe below and turn on notifications so you don't miss any future. This, this, um, yeah, I got particularly inspired because this intro, actually, it applies um, to everyone who's listening to the Bliss podcast also. Please subscribe and hit the like <laughs> button on the video <laughs> for this video that you're watching. Or just plagiarize him. Yeah, thank you. He, he did a good advertising for us, even within our own thing. Nice. Content. Because when it comes to the levels of reality, it's important to realize that this understanding of these levels and what they mean can directly impact how we see the world. And not just how we see the world, but then how we move through it and how we act in it and how we live in it. Changing this perception and understanding these levels helps us find inner peace by realizing what is versus what is not, and therefore what can help us versus what can hurt us. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. This guy speaks so fast. Yeah, it's quite a lot of information very quickly. Yeah, maybe you can, well, 
Tell me, who, who is this person? This person Where goes by the name uh, Vishuddha Das, and um, he's also known as Koi Fresco. I think this... Uh, is he a devotee? Well, um, he, he doesn't exactly um, chant Hare Krishna, I don't know, possibly, but he calls himself a Bhakti Yogi. Really? Yeah. He talks about some Bhakti Yoga there, and he, he calls himself like a, hind, a, a follower of Hindu principles. Right? So that's what we are, right? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we kick out this Hindu word. We're not Hindu, Prabhu? No. The whole time I've been in no, a great grand illusion. Yes, you've been in an illusion. The, the Hindu word uh, is a, like a nickname mm. that was given by the Mohammedans ah. to the inhabitants of the um, um, the people who lived on the... the, the um, the uh, across uh, across the river Sindus. Ah. There's a river Sindus, mm -hmm. and because the Muslim people they could not pronounce uh, Sindus, they would say Hindus, uh -huh. and that's how the word um, came about. So this whole cultural phenomenon, Hinduism, that's just a mispronunciation. And it's like a bad word. Wow. Like sometimes they call the black people um, oh, the N N right. words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not gonna mention the that B word. Words. Yeah, okay. very bad words. So, unfortunately, um, the Indian people themselves don't understand how insulting this word is. Ah. So it is passed as a, you know, as a, as a normality, as a, as a denomination oh. of a, you know, it's basically a, a, a box where you, mm. you, they trying to put the Vedic culture, the Vedic knowledge, mm. Bhagavad Gita, they put it in this box and they throw it in the garbage, so to speak. So don't be misguided. This word Hindu is a big no-no. Okay. It's a great insult to the Vedic uh -huh. culture, called something in such a nonsense way, you know, nonsense way, Hindu. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to do with location. Right. The Vedic knowledge is meant for everyone. Mm -hmm. just it's, like, yeah. yeah, just like any knowledge. Knowledge. Yeah. It's not sectarian. Yeah. I think that's all for this section. Let's play some more nectar. This all stems originally from the ancient Vedantic philosophy of Hinduism, the world's oldest and most detailed religion as shown in the Vedas and the Upanishads, and in that they mention these levels of reality. I, did he just say that it's... Who is this guy? This, this guy is, uh, he's like a YouTuber. He talks about spirituality, specifically um, Vedanta. Mm -hmm. He says, but did he just say the Hindu is found in the Vedas and the Upanishads? No, that is impossible. This word, I don't think, is actually there. You don't find that word in the Vedas. It's not there, because as I said, the Hindu word has been invented a few hundred years ago. The Vedas were written down 5,000 years ago. They were written down five years ago. Maybe yeah. you want to well, you wanna, uh, elaborate on this particular usage of the, of the phrase written down 5,000 years ago. Yeah, because the Vedas are called Shuti, Shuti means understood by hearing. So prior to the beginning of Kali Yuga, which is the age of deterioration, people had very sharp memories, so they would remember everything by heart without adulteration. So the Vedas were passed down in an oral tradition. But 5,000 years ago, Srila Vyasadeva, who is the empowered incarnation of Narayan, Krishna, written it down, wrote it down for the people of Kali Yuga with very uh, um, short memories. So um, it's impossible to find that word in the Vedas because it's made up. He doesn't remember because it's Kali Yuga. Yeah. Okay, so who is Fred? This this is Fresco. This is Fresco. He talks specifically about um, uh, like as how to become a transcendentalist kind of, and uh, yeah, he he specifically talks about um, the Vedas. Uh, that's his kind of his uh, speciality, you could say. Okay, well then we're together. Yeah, let's see what he has to say which now, hundreds of years later, has been shown in many different scientific tests, which we'll get to. But before we get there, we need to understand... Scientific tests? I don't quite follow because I, I guess he's trying to say that science proves the Vedas. Is that possible, Prabhu? Well, if you mean that science, as we know, uh, usually, the, you know, the, 
the materialistic scientist observing something with a limited sense perception and limited mind and making a conclusion that is being changed regularly on a regular basis, then that is quite foolish. Mm. That, you know, that, that we need... That. It's kind of like trying to uh, fit an elephant into a matchbox. Mm -hmm quite an impossible task. I mean, why would you even want to do that? Why would you want to prove the Vedas, that is the real knowledge, transcendental knowledge that is always true by some people who are completely incompetent to verify anything? I think it's because they don't understand what the Vedas actually are. Mm. Yeah, the word Veda means knowledge. Uh, knowledge is universal, just like 2 plus 2 is 4. That is the same for a Christian, for a Buddhist, for an atheist, for everyone. This is knowledge. When we speak of faith, that might be different. But knowledge, Veda, is one. So uh, the real scientists are taking the information from the Veda. This is the difference between uh, what we call the Avaroha Panta and Aroha Panta. The Avaroha Panta it means the simplic succession, the knowledge that descends from the perfect source, Krishna. Who could be more perfect source than the Supreme Personality of Godhead? The whom? The, the whom what? Whom or what? What is that whom or what? <laughs> you, you said uh, the Supreme Person... Uh, what was that? The Supreme Personality of Godhead. Who is that? Krishna. Okay. Krishna. And, and what, is it, what does it mean exactly? Well, the Supreme Personality. You are a person, right? Uh -huh. So, but there's someone better than you. Okay. In some quality, right? You have some qualities. Like I say, you are rich, which you are not. But anyway, let's use it as an example. <laughs> I've got a big hole in the back of my gurta right, right now that proves your statement to be false. Yeah, I confirm. <laughs> so, uh, someone might be more rich than you. But there's someone rich, more rich than that person also. So ultimately, there must be a person who's the most rich, the most intelligent, the most beautiful, the most famous, the most knowledgeable. That is Krishna. Ah. Bhagavan Shri Krishna. Mm -hmm. So whatever, even if you don't accept it, it's Krishna. The, the idea of perfection is there. Mm -hmm. Everyone is searching. Everyone wants to be number one. That is the proof there is God. Everyone wants to compete. I want to be the best. I want to, you know, go for the highest. Always. This evolution, right? They, they say evolution. The scientists, nonsense scientists. They say evolution. So the very notion of trying to evolve uh, towards perfection, towards something. Evolving means evolving towards perfection. Otherwise, evolution uh, doesn't make any sense. Yeah, there must be the beginning of evolution and the end. So um, that very desire to evolve means that we have some idea of God, supreme personality of God. It is intrinsic. Does that mean we can evolve and become God, Prabhu? <laughs> no, that is impossible. God is eternal and you are eternal. Nityo nityanam chetanas chetana nam in the Upanishad is very nicely. Explain. Uh, you are eternal. Krishna is eternal. But Krishna is the supreme eternal. You're the minute eternal. So the difference is that the supreme eternal Krishna is providing, is maintaining all these tiny li living entities eternal. <clears throat> so um, that is the difference. Also Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Natu evam jatu naasvam natvam nemi janadipa natchaivana bhavishyama sarvavaya mata param. What does it mean? Do you know? It means there was never a time when I, you, all these kings did not exist. But the meaning is that we're all um, individuals eternally. Every consciousness is an individual consciousness eternally. We don't merge. So God is there. And if we take the information from God, that is perfect science. Because God, a perfect being, whatever, even if you don't accept it's Krishna. We know it's Krishna, but if you have some bias that it is not Krishna, just say God, perfect being. Uh, he must have perfect knowledge because he, 
he's omniscient, he's supremely conscious, he knows about the past, present, future, he is um, present in every single aspect of the creation, and at the same time he's separate from the creation, he's not affected by it. Uh, he must know what is going on. So if we take the information, uh, the, the knowledge about this material world and the spiritual world from Krishna, from God, uh, that is perfect knowledge. That is perfect science. So that is called Avaroha Panta. And that science descends uh, through the disciplic succession, Parampara, disciplic succession of self-realized spiritual masters. They're transparent via mediums, pure devotees, completely free from material desire, uh, who are devotees, pure devotees of Krishna. Through, through, so through this chain of the disciplic succession, the knowledge is passing through unchanged. And if we accept such a spiritual master coming in a disciplic succession, then we have perfect knowledge. This is perfect science. Just like you go to a university, right? If you want to learn the materialistic science, let's say medicine, you can... Uh, speculate at home how to operate you know you take a knife kitchen knife you take your friend <laughs> you cut his belly more like maybe an enemy <laughs> and you experiment right so who will agree to undergo such an experiment with you no one but if you go to university you go through the training there's a teacher there's a discipline succession and so on so on so it is not at you know, accepting some authority and uh, surrendering to a guru and keeping blind faith in some authority is simply the monopoly of spiritualists. It is everywhere. This, For example, um, of course, now I don't know if people are watching TV, but when I was young, we were watching TV and there was a TV guide. Right. And you have, you have also experienced. So in the TV guide, there was, okay, 6 o'clock, The Simpsons. 8 o'clock, the news, and so on, so on. And when you watch the TV, actually, that's what happened, right? So we're using the Avara Panta even in material life. The other system of acquiring knowledge is called um, Aroha Panta. Aroha Panta means that instead of accepting authority, uh, I manufacture or I speculate. I try to find out uh, on my own, uh, who is God? Oh, I will not listen to any religion. I will try to find God within. And then people confuse. They think that, oh, I am God. Right? They don't even understand who is God. They think I am perfect being. Hmm. Because they have no experience of any other um, personality who is superior. Or they're in this self-delusion that even someone shows them that he's superior in knowledge. They say, no, no, no. This is relative. It's according to you, you are perfect, but I am still perfect. So this is called Aroha Panta. That is the uh, process acquired by foolish people. Foolish people who want to experiment unnecessarily. Right? If the information is there, uh, if you can get the, for example, if you're looking for something, you can go on the internet, just Google it. Why you are traveling and searching you know, and doing the experiments, just use the authority of the internet. Similarly, in spiritual affairs, the traditions of uh, spiritualists who have been practicing a spiritual life for thousands of years, and the Vedic culture is one of them, and I'm the prominent one. So why not study uh, from those who are already experts? <clears throat> How do you know they're experts? Well, at least... They've been doing it for a long time. Right. How do you know that the medicine science is bona fide in a university? You can't know. You know, just for argument's sake, the whole world can be an illusion. That actually, that's bona fide um, uh, science, medicine taught at the university. They might all be cheated, lying. And sometimes it happens like that, yeah. right? But the people still go. Why? Because they have necessity, right? They want to become doctors. They want to get a job. They want to help people and so on and so on. So it is a question of necessity. You must be um, willing to accept the guidance. You must understand the this human life is very short and 
uh, we're suffering here and we have a higher mission. We're not animals simply eating, sleeping, mating, and event. We have the brain to contemplate things, especially if things go a little rough, then we start contemplating what is the aim of this life. And if we're simply enjoying, like animals, uh, we try to push, uh, suppress this natural feeling, you know, it's a so that is the preliminary qualification that we should let it out, that questioning, that question. We should let it out, explore it, don't be afraid of it. Yeah, I'm gonna die, yes, yes, it's a, it's a fact. Now, what I'm gonna do about it? Why should I suppress it? Why should I be a mudha, just following? Well, everyone is trying to deny it. And they're just like, no, oh, don't worry about it. Let's just enjoy. Let's just work. Everyone is dragging you to Maya. Just forget about it. Let's enjoy. Come on, come on. Don't be so too complicated. And right, don't be too complicated. So you should think for yourself. You're gonna die alone. You're not gonna die with all these people. Everyone is dying alone. Even your family cannot be there with you. So you should think for yourself. It doesn't mean that you are negligent of the other persons. But everyone has to deal with their own self-realization. Unless you yourself are self-realized, unless you yourself are fixed, how can you help others, right? A drowning man cannot help the other drowning man. So this is called Athatu Brahma Jigyasa, the inquiry about the absolute truth. This is how the Vedanta Sutra begins. Vedanta Sutra is a book that summarizes all the Vedas. So this is the beginning of Vedanta Sutra. These were the qualification uh, to hear or to understand Vedic knowledge. Tato Brahma Jigyasa. You must have inquiry. Hmm? Yeah, I like that point you brought up about the uh, that it's everyone should ask this question because everyone is looking for enjoyment in the material world. Everywhere you go, every place you go to, every person you meet, they're all looking to enjoy, to find pleasure in varieties of activities, whether it's through family or for job or through money or through car or all these things. Or through Mayavad. Or through Mayavad philosophy, spirit, so-called spirituality. <clears throat> so everyone's looking for the pleasure, but everyone's frustrated in the pleasure. Has anyone found eternal pleasure? Has anyone found pleasure that doesn't end or isn't frustrating or isn't momentary. Even the highest pleasure of life, sex life, is just a relief. We talked about this in the last podcast also, I think, but sex life is just a, a relief from anxiety. The muscles relax in the body, that's all. So this highest pleasure that people are looking for, it's completely um, illusory. So, um, you should, we should ask, I want to, we should, we should consider that I want to enjoy, I want to find pleasure. It's, everyone's looking for it, but still, the nature of my body and the nature of the world is that I can't enjoy. So what is this? And also that question, should, we should go deeper and deeper and we should ask, what is the ultimate? Mm. We should not be satisfied because this is how people get cheated. They're a little bit interested but they're also materially concerned. Mm. You know, I should have a, at least this fundamental knowledge that nothing material can satisfy me because it's impermanent. I am permanent, I am eternal. Uh, that is not some kind of a belief, but it's a fact. My body is changing throughout my whole life, but who is observing that it is changing? It is me, it is the consciousness. So consciousness doesn't depend on the body. If the consciousness was created the body or was depending on the body, then it will be gone with the body, right? But my childhood body is gone, but I am still here. I'm not gone. That means the consciousness is transcendental. Mm. The consciousness, that through which you're listening to this podcast right now, or through that which you're looking in the room, you know, around you, that is because con as soon as the consciousness is gone from the body, as soon as, as soon as the consciousness leaves the body, the eye doesn't see, the ear doesn't hear, the nose doesn't smell. So that consciousness, that is you, that is the soul. <coughs> and if we understand this point, 
then we must inquire about the eternal knowledge, not temporary knowledge, not something incomplete, something superficial. We must come to the highest, to the eternal. So with this attitude, uh, we should take up the study of the Vedas. If we have uh, some motivation, you know, that I want to relieve my stress, um, I want to, even, even that is a material motivation because, okay, you relieve your stress, but like you said, you know, sex life is simply a relief of some pressure, some passion. Um, that is not pleasure. Pleasure, when we speak of pleasure, pleasure means positive. Hmm. You know, if I meet you and I ask you, how are you? And you say, oh, I'm very good. I don't have cancer. So <laughs> it's not really a, that's not a, really a, like a happy life. Oh, I don't have cancer and I, I was not killed yesterday night, at, at, you know, in downtown. Uh, if I say, oh, wow, very good. I, you, that's not, it's, <laughs> it's not a happy life. It's kind of like if you say, um, yeah, I'm, I'm great. I don't have cancer. But, you know, I, I hate my job. I hate my wife, my kids. My whole life is boring. I want to kill myself aside from that. So, yeah, you can have like some things negating, but that doesn't mean you're happy. Yeah, even if you say, I don't have any suffering, you know, I don't have a problem with job or wife and, you know, still that is not happiness. Happiness means positive pleasure. Huh? Krishna, Krishna is the supreme personality, individuality. We're also individual eternally and we enjoy eternally with Krishna in spiritual relationship. He is the supreme Lord. And we're the supreme, uh, we're not the supreme, we're servants. Oh, almost agreeing with Koi Fresca there. But we are supreme servants. Yeah. But we're servants, we're supreme. When we become servants of Krishna, mm. then we become supreme servants. Mm. See, that is good. Just like in the government, Prabhupada gives this example. If someone gets a government job, that is a good job. Mm. Because the government jobs are well paid and well taken care of. That is a prestigious job. Right. If you're a servant, if you're a worker, in some bar washing dishes or something. You're a servant, but you're a low-class servant. Right. You know, or a servant of a king. Prabhupada says, there's a servant of the king. Imagine, you know, um, Queen Elizabeth. Right. Right. If you're her servant, you enjoy almost on the same level with her. Right. Because wherever she goes, she goes with you. Oh, you come with me. You're going to assist me. Right. And then, oh, you take what I eat. Right. You enjoy with me. I go holiday. You live in my holiday. palace. You live in my palace. You have the same, you know, see, so... A devotee is a supreme servant. It is a very prestigious um, position. And these relationships we have here are the reflections of relationships we have on the transcendental platform with Krishna in the spiritual world. So all these loving relationships, all these varieties of pleasures, eating, sleeping, uh, whatever, even sex life, everything is present in the spiritual world. But it is transcendental. It is eternal, full of knowledge, full of bliss. There is no anxiety. There is no inebriety. There is no, uh, you know, electricity bill. <laughs> yeah, well, the planets are powered, uh, self-illuminated there, so no electricity bill. Okay, oh, I almost forgot, Prabhu. We were actually, we were, um, we were watching a video there, I think. Okay. Let's it's just what reality is, right? When I say reality and these levels of reality, what do I mean? Well, we're going to use the word reality as synonymous with the word Brahman. Now, Brahman in Hindu philosophy translates roughly to allness or wholeness, <coughs> beingness as it is. And if we were going to use that in English in a conceptual form, we would call it the cosmos. Uh, not the universe, but the cosmos. So reality is the cosmos in this essence. And like Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is all that ever is, or ever was, or ever will be. All of beingness at all levels and all the multiple dimensions and realities beyond space and time itself, and really far beyond human conception, all of it is the cosmos. So... People need a little translation here because that was a lot of uh, jugglery of words. So um, what Koi, from what I understand he's saying here, is that um, reality, everything that's included in reality, what we can perceive and also beyond our perception, apparently in the Vedas, 
and the Upanishads is referred to as Brahman. So, um, and that is eternal. Everything is going on there. That is the absolute truth. Everythingness, oneness, in its essence. Yeah, well, that is not exactly the truth. There are things beyond Brahman. What? But Brahman is everything, Prabhu. That's in the Vedas. Uh, Srila Vyasadeva, who compiled the Vedas, Vedascha Sarvam Aham Vedyam, Krishna says, Vedanta Vit Vedanta Kit Chaham. I am the compiler and I am the knower of the Vedas, he says. So that refers, that shloka refers, the Bhagavad Gita refers to Srila Vyasadeva, the incarnation of Krishna who compiled the Vedas. Um, he wrote a uh, summary of the Vedas, as I said before, Vedanta Sutra, and then he wrote a commentary on this Vedanta Sutra, natural commentary. The author himself is writing a commentary. You know, how can there be any, any better commentary on the Vedanta Sutra, that sutra than from Srila Vyasadeva himself? In that commentary, in the first canto, Srila Vyasadeva says, um, Brahmeti Paramahmeti Bhagavan Iti Shabhyate. The uh, um, absolute truth is realized in three aspects. Brahman, the impersonal Brahman, the Parabrahman or Paramatma, and ultimately Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And these can be uh, compared to the uh, uh, sunshine, sun planet, and sun god. See, you can realize the sun in three aspects also. Those who are very distant, they have the contact with the sunshine. Right? It's satisfied. Just like we now have a sunshine in this room. So we have a realization of the sun through the sunshine. But someone who's a little bit more scientific, he, he understands that the sunshine is coming from the sun planet. See, this is usually the mistake the impersonalists do. They think that, well, the personality of Krishna is localized. He has a form. He has a body. He has a personality, he has a persona, it's Krishna. So how can that be God? That which is all-pervading, the Brahman, must be superior. Right. right. But when you look at the sun, the sun is localized and the sunshine is all-pervading. But what is more important? Hmm. The sun or the sunshine? The sun. The sun, because the sun is the source. If there's no sun, there is no sunshine. You cannot have sunshine um, without the source of the sunshine. Mm. So, um, that is the uh, Paramatma feature, the Paramatma realization. The yogis, they realize the Paramatma feature mm -hmm. within their heart. And ultimately, you come to the Bhagavan feature, that is the source uh, of the uh, sun planet or the Paramatma also, and that is the personality of Krishna, the uh, uh, possessor of the six opulences. We talked about this before, right? Yeah. Not in this podcast. No, we did. But in this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We talked about the supreme being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The most rich. Yeah. Bhaga means opulence. So uh, there's wealth, there's fame, there's knowledge, there's renunciation, beauty, strength. There's all the f uh, six opulences. And whoever possesses these unlimitedly and simultaneously, that is Bhagavan or God. So that is Krishna. So Krishna is realizing three aspects. One who understands Krishna automatically understands the uh, Brahman or the sunshine, automatically understands the Paramatma. But those who only understand the Brahman, they have a difficulty to understand Krishna. Right. You see, so we have to go higher. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Brahmanohi pratishtaham amritasya vyasyasya cha." Shashvatasya cha dharmasya, sukkasya kantikasya cha. Um, I am the basis of the impersonal Brahman, Krishna says, which is the constitutional position of ultimate happiness and which is immortal, imperishable and eternal. You see? So, Krishna is the source of the Brahman. It is not that Brahman is everything. Brahman is just one aspect of Krishna. So, if we don't come to the complete understanding, then we will not be able to stay um, fixed in that sort of meditation. That is also confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. In the 12th chapter, 
Arjuna is asking, what is superior? The impersonal conception of the absolute truth or the personal? Right in the beginning. <clears throat> Arjuna is asking, uh, which is considered to be more perfect? Those who are properly engaged in your devotional service or those who worship the impersonal Brahman, the unmanifested? And then, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, Maya Vesya Mano Yimam Nitya Yukta Upasate, Shradaya Parayo Petas Teme Yukta Tatmamata. He whose mind is fixed on my personal form, always engaged in worshipping me with great and transcendent of faith, is considered by me to be most perfect. So, uh, we taking the uh, authority of the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is authorized Vedic scripture. It is read all over the world. Even people like Einstein were reading the Bhagavad Gita. Um, we're not manufacturing. This is not a sectarian. That now we have our opinion and you have your opinion. This is, if you want to understand the Vedas, the Vedas clearly say this. And there are many other references. Ultimately, um, uh, the personal aspect is superior according to the Vedic conclusion. Even the uh, uh, founder of the impersonal school of thought, Sri Shankaracharya. Shankaracharya, maybe those who practice yoga, they heard this name. In his commentary on this very scripture, Bhagavad Gita, Gita uh, Bhashya, he says, uh, Narayana para avyaktat. Narayan, Krishna, is beyond this material manifestation. This material world is created Krishna's personality, Krishna's body is not created. Shankaracharya is, according to the Padma Purana, this is another Vedic scripture, is considered to be the incarnation of Lord Shiva. Hmm. Lord Shiva. Uh, similarly, Lord Bhama, in his treatise, Sri Brahma Samhita, mentions, Ishwara Parama Krishna Satchitananda Vigraha Anadir Adir Govinda Sarvakarana Karanam Krishna, there are many Ishwaras, many controllers, but Krishna is the supreme Ishwara, Parameshwara, and his body is Satchitananda, uh, full of eternity, full of bliss, full of knowledge. Satchitananda, Vigraha, and he has a form. Vigraha means form, eternal form, not like my form. My form is going to be finished. I mean, sometimes I think it already is finished. <laughs> I feel so rubbish. <laughs> Uh, but Krishna's body is eternally fresh. He always remains youthful. Nabayovanamcha. That is also mentioned by Lord Brahma. And he is Karana Karanam. He is the cause of all causes. So um, when we take, when we consult the Vedic scriptures, it is very clear that Krishna's personality is not uh, a product of imagination or some, you know, material nature manifested this body. It's eternal. And then it's the topmost perfection of spiritual realization. Another thing this uh, Prabhu said, I mean, I'm sure he's a very nice person. Yeah. It, this is not anything personal. I Just misled. <laughs> I don't know. He, I, I'm sure he means well, but um, um, so far we're concerned. Uh, we... we uh, um, even this um, idea of cosmos he mentioned, um, if he means the material cosmos, he quoted some personality there. Mr. You know better. Uh, Mr. Koi. Ah, the, oh, Carl Sagan. Yeah. What did he say? He said Carl, Carl Sagan. Who's a, Carl Sagan is like a, a material scientist, actually. But he says, the cosmos is all that ever was, all that ever will be, and all that ever is. Something like that. Yeah, so that is not exactly like that. The cosmos is, is temporary. And that is again confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Krishna says, Avyaktat vyakta sarva prabhavanti ahar agame ratri agame praliyante tatraiva vyakta samgyaki when Brahma's day is manifest, this multitude of living entities comes into being, and at the arrival of Brahma's night, they're all annihilated. Is he? So the cosmos is created and destroyed, and it goes in cycles. 
uh, and here our spiritual master, he comments, he says, the less intelligent jivas try to remain within this material world and are accordingly elevated and degraded in various planetary systems. During the daytime of Brahma, they exhibit their activities and at the coming of Brahma's night, they're annihilated. In the day, they receive various bodies for material activities and at night, these bodies perish. The jivas, individual souls, remain compact in the body of Vishnu and again and again are manifest at the arrival of Brahma's day. When Brahma's life is finally finished, they're all annihilated and remain unmanifest for millions and millions of years. Finally, when Brahma is born again in another millennium, they are again manifest. In this way, the jivas are captivated by the material world. <clears throat> you see, so um, the cosmos, I mean, even logically, we can see everything around you is temporary. Everything has a sat uh, the, there's a point of um, annihilation. This is the nature of matter. So anything that is material is temporary. That which is eternal stays. That which is temporary does not ex um, does not uh, exist. Ex it exists, but temporarily. Has no does not last. Endurance. Doesn't doesn't last. It has no endurance. Yes. So um, this is also a, a, a mis misunderstanding. The cosmos is not eternal, but there is another um, eternal. Uh, atmosphere that also Krishna says and that is the spiritual world that's I was mentioning that before that's where we're supposed to go uh, back home back to Krishna to enjoy eternally with Krishna dance and chant and take nice prasadam eternally Arrivo. with Krishna it's such a wonderful time eternally this is not some kind of a cheating uh, uh, relationship or a cheating activity it is eternal full of bliss, unlimited bliss, ever-expanding, unlimited uh, varieties of enjoyment you can have with Krishna, our eternal lover. So, um, uh, Krishna says, Parastasma tu bhavo anyo avyakto avyakta sanatana yasa sarvesh bhuteshu nasyatsu na vinashyati. Yet there is another nature which is eternal and is transcendental to this manifested unma and unmanifested matter. See, matter is manifested and unmanifested. Mm -hmm. It goes in cycles. But the spiritual world is eternally manifested. It is supreme and it is never annihilated. When all in this world is annihilated, that part remains as it is. And I can just add another shloka from the Ishapanishad. Um, it is mentioned, this is from the Upanishads. Hiran mayena patrena satyasya pehitam mukham. Um, the devotee is praying that all supreme maintainer of all beings kindly remove these this dazzling effulgence. Hiran Mayena refers to Brahman. Uh, see, more advanced spiritualist, he is asking, please, my Lord, remove this Brahman, this shining effulgence. The, the Brahman is actually the transcendental effulgence that is emanating from Krishna's transcendental body. I was mentioning the example of a sun and a sunshine. So imagine the, the Krishna is like the sun and this Brahman, Brahma Jyoti is emanating from him. So a devotee, he's praying that Krishna removes that Brahman so he can see his transcendental face. This is mentioned in the Upanishad. So this is certainly not the ultimate knowledge that everything is Brahman. We have to go beyond that. I mean, we have a personality. Okay, it might be um, materially contaminated. But otherwise, if we say that well, there's no personality, there's no difference between me and others, there's no difference between you and me, there's no point of any philosophy, any argument. There's no point of anything, any practice, anything. Right. Yeah, but that brings up the point. In the teachings of Lord Buddha, which you can get if you become a Patreon member, that um, when there's, uh, if there's no question of I or you, then there's no meaning to the argument at all. There has to be somebody in knowledge or somebody in ignorance or somebody with an opinion or with another opinion. You can't have um, the same being. There's no other philosophy. There's nothing to be taught. There's nothing to be learnt. There's no point to anything, like you said. 
Yeah, suppose we don't agree with this philosophy, then um, what is his name? Koi. Koi, Koi, according to his own philosophy, would have to agree with us, yeah. whatever we say. Because we are him and we're telling him the truth. Exactly. Yeah, so I'd also like to mention a, a point about... Um... So when we're talking about levels of reality, we're talking about it in regards to the cosmos as a whole. The complete allness of being. Not just for our own human life and our own human idea of levels. But that is precisely the thing about levels, is that the idea of levels are a human concept, right? They're a linguistic construct that we have created as society. In nature, there's no inherent levels, right? You don't see level one, level two, level three. But in the human mind, over time, we've created this idea of levels, of differentiating things, of invisible and ancient lines, so to speak, that separate us from others, or our intelligence from another version of intelligence, or so there you go. This is it. As I was saying, now now he's saying that uh, there's a separate. This is a human construct that we're individual. That you have a different opinion, and I have a different opinion, and so on. I mean, what is the the evidence to this? That this is a human construct. Who who said that? You know, if I say that you are just a construct, you you are just a concept. I can just punch you in the face. You, you don't exist really. It's a kind of a silly philosophy. Yeah, it's ironic that he's talking about the Vedas and the Upanishads as the source of the knowledge that he's talking about, but he doesn't quote anything that he's saying. Like Prabhu just quoted, you know, Bhagavad Gita, Vedanta Sutra, Upanishads, but, you know, that, and that supports everything that we're saying. But if someone here says now everything is basically um, not real, just imaginary in your mind, and then doesn't say, why he's saying that or who he gets this information from, that's, um, that's nonsense, that's cheating, philosophy. If these concepts of differentiations are simply human construct, then to say that, you know, all these things are just human, it's also a human construct. <laughs> right. That's why we sh it should be rejected also. Yeah, the, the very words that he's using are also um, not real. If I say that, I'm not speaking. What kind of philosophy is it? It's self-contradictory. Right. right. If you want to come to oneness, which I think this uh, person, he wants to come to the unification of everything, which is a good um, ideal. ideal to see the unity of living entities and so on and so on, um, then uh, uh, there should not be contradiction. As soon as you have contradiction, you have duality. If you have duality, you can't have peace of mind. There, there are two functions of the mind, sankalpa and vikalpa. The mind accepts and the mind rejects. So if you have this kind of idea, actually he speaks about this. He says two levels. We separate everything on two levels. But you can't avoid it. Even he says that there's oneness and then there's this human construct. Right. So you, that's a duality. You can't escape the duality. You can't escape the two levels. See, it's just a wishful thinking, you know, that I have escaped these two levels. But no, we can see that he himself is using the two levels. Even the very phrase, I have escaped these two levels, is also two levels. Because there's I and the, and the levels that you're escaping. You're making a distinction between you, the observer and the doer and the reality that you're escaping or even going to. You can't escape the duality because the duality is the reality, man. Yeah, ultimately, if there's no difference between me and the video I'm watching, then what is the point of watching it in the first place? If the video I'm watching and me are one, then I have nothing to learn from the video. Anyway, let's go on or this form of life from another form of life. We utilize this idea of levels to understand and live in the world. To be part of this experience can be can be improved with the concept of levels. So in regards to these levels of reality again. He says here that um, our life can be improved with the concept of different levels of reality. And I think he said also uh, that we can find our place within this experience. What is our place within the experience? 
But if everything is one, Brahman, there's no question of within Brahman and outside or without Brahman. If everything is one, there's no within or without. There's also no question of you being within something also. There's no you to be within something or place there to be. Yes, so these are contradictory. Right. You can't escape the platform of um, <clears throat> not just duality, but also of um, self, individual self. He's talking about, uh, you know, he's, he's addressing his audience here. We... We want to find unity. We want to have our paths. We want to have our experience. We put labels on things. And we can improve our life. And so um, even though he's talking about oneness as, a, as an ultimate ideal, still he can't escape um, self in everything. Everything is from a position of uh, individual consciousness. Because that is the reality, actually. I've ne I, he can't speak from the... Uh, platform of brahman and, and if he said i think he says it's indescribable in, in, brahman is um inexpressible so anyway if it's inexpressible how are you trying to express it what's the point of the video at all you know how can something that is um dualistic you know he said these two levels this is dualistic vision in other words illusory vision imperfect help you to improve <laughs> your understanding of the complete absolute right how can something that is imperfect can help you to reach perfection right anyway let's go on and these are perceptual levels at least one of them is there are levels in the mind and levels in our own understanding of being that is to say in this sense we are using this concept of levels to help us better live and understand existence as a whole in our place within it so these two levels are very cut and clear about what they are and why that's so powerful, we'll get to see, but they are known as Saguna Brahman and Nirguna Brahman. Saguna Brahman is Brahman with qualities, so the cosmos with qualities, and Nirguna Brahman is the cosmos without qualities, or better yet, the cosmos beyond the qualitative state. And what we live in right now, and the way we perceive reality, and the way we will always live in this human ego-minded form is in Saguna Brahman, in Brahman with qualities. We live in a cosmos that we see and define with qualities, that we describe and identify with qualities, the same way we describe and identify our own mind and the people around us with qualities as well. And this... There's a nice saying that a blind man thinks that everyone else is blind. So um, the Vedic knowledge, as I said before, I, I'm not sure if I said it before, but it is Aparoshia. Yeah, he did. It is coming from the perfect source. So, okay, our mind is limited. Our mind is imperfect. It's conditioned. It's, you know, polluted, whatever. But if the absolute whether it's impersonal or personal, whatever, that we can discuss later. But if the Absolute, Himself, Itself, whatever you want to call it, defines what is the Absolute, how can it be relative? Right. So Vedic knowledge is not like that. When Krishna comes and He says, I'm like this, I'm like that, this is my nature, then it is not a human concept. Right. This is this is the reality. Mm. I cannot understand. I cannot describe God through my limited sense perception. Right. But if a God Himself comes and He says, "This is like the, what is the objection? Right. How can I object? No, it can't be like that. Why not? You just admitted yourself that you cannot understand beyond um, your qualitative experience, your your uh, senses. Yeah. If you if you simply understand this point that I am imperfect. That means that the perfection exists. Mm. There must be someone who is perfect. Otherwise, how can I even know that I am imperfect? Right. And as he also admitted, this is a world of duality. He's trying to escape the world of duality, but duality means there must be perfection also. Exactly. So, um, uh, this knowledge can be understood from a bona fide spiritual master who explains uh, the Vedas, and this is how we know who is God, who is Krishna, not by speculating. Just like um, in any other sphere of life, 
for example, um, I don't necessarily have to know how this computer works. I don't know how these chips are connected to it. I'm not an electrician, uh, computer scientist, uh, but there's one knowledge I have, how to turn it on. Hmm. And I use the computer for my purpose, for writing articles and so on and so on. So similarly, we can't know God. We don't say that. We don't say that we know God completely. But we know God to the extent uh, that we need to know God, to render service to Him, to have a relationship with Krishna. And this is real knowledge. This is real education. And uh, simply speculating and guessing and saying that, oh, it's a human concept, everything is human concept, um, this is just a negative definition of God. You can have a negative definition, you can have a positive. For example, if I say computer is not a giraffe, a computer is not a table, computer is not a swimming pool, this is all correct, but it is not a definition. If you want to give a positive definition, you might say computer is a machine with a keyboard, with a monitor, you can write on it, you can go on the internet with it, you can do this so many things. So um, similarly, um, this is just going around, you know, the bushes, you know, it's not this, it's a human. But what is Brahman? What, who is God? What is his form? What is his personality? How come he doesn't have a form? He must have a form. In the Upanishads, it's mentioned, this is how Shri Upanishad begins. Om Purnam Adaha Purnamidam Purnat Purnat Urachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamay Baba Shishate. The complete whole is perfect and complete. And because it is complete, that's why all the emanations from the complete whole are also um, complete by themselves. And despite the fact that so many complete un units emanate from the complete whole, the complete whole remains uh, the complete balance. This is stated in the invocation of the Sri Zopanishad. So, um, the complete whole, God, Parabrahman, whatever you want to call, we, we call him Krishna, because we, we uh, have a personal relationship with, with God. So, um, God has a name, so that name is Krishna. We call him by his name, Krishna. Uh, he must have a form, he must have a personality, he must have individuality, he must be conscious. How can, you know, the uh, Supreme Absolute be unconscious? Right, what so a limitation, right. right? If I knock you out, if I punch you now, and you become unconscious. I mean, that is the ultimate limitation. You can't do anything if mm. you're unconscious. Mm. So these people, they just want to kill God. They want to make him unconscious, right. formless. Um, Envious of God. <laughs> what kind of... You know, if, if you want to open your mind, expand your mind, grow, you know, spiritually grow, uh, you can't, you know, just remain on this platform of denying, denying and denying. It's not this, it's a human concept. Everything is illusion. Everything is maya. Everything is a human conception and we have to become free from everything and even from the uh, desire to become free from everything and from the desire to become everything. And, to, you know, this is, you know, frustration. So we say that, no, 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 this idea of myself as a body, as a material body, my material identity as a, you know, English man, Spanish man, whatever, American man, uh, th this upadi should definitely be, is a, it, that's a human concept. Yes, that is true. America wasn't here um, 1,000 years ago. Europe was not here, was not called Europe before. These are human concepts, yes, but... The individuality itself and the personality is not a human concept. That is eternal reality. Nityo nityanam chetanas chetananam. Very clearly said, the uh, Upanishads, they very clearly distinguish the supreme eternal, supreme conscious, Krishna, and the minute eternal, minute conscious, myself. So, um, I don't know if you want to say something, Prabhu. Yeah, sure. There's a... Uh... Also, this point that this Prabhu is mentioning the Vedas and the Upanishads. And uh, yeah, like you mentioned, that um, this uh, negation, neti neti, not this, not this, to find out what is God. This is something that um, the Shankarites or this uh, Prabhu, his school of thought, like that ultimately uh, he mentioned that Niguna Brahman, everything is 
without quality in the absolute. Everything above material, everything spiritual is just nothingness. So um, this understanding is uh, derived from the Upanishads and uh, a lot, there's 108 Upanishads and a lot of them, they describe, almost all of them actually, they describe God as impersonal, this Naguna Brahman without quality. So Shankarites, they take some shlokas, some verses from these Upanishads and then they say uh, from these verses, clearly it's stated that God is uh, impersonal. He has no, uh, like it says that he has no hands, he has no legs, he has no eyes. But it's confirmed in other Upanishads, um, for example, well, the first and most important um, one to understand is uh, that in the Harasira Pancharatra, which is another kind of uh, Vedic scripture, uh, every Upanishad initially says that the Brahman is impersonal, like this koi, he said, Nigun Sagun. Okay, so every Upanishad says like that, it's Nigun Brahman. But um, then they establish that Krishna is actually the ultimate uh, uh, goal of understanding that particular Upanishad, that the personal uh, form of God is the ultimate. So with that understanding, then you can read um, shlokas uh, like in the Svetishvata Upanishads, that say uh, he has no material legs and hands. But then you can understand that he has spiritual legs and hands because it says that he accepts everything that we offer to him. And also there's another verse in the Isha Upanishad, Prabhu, you know, maybe you could quote that Sanskrit, it's very nice. Tad ejati, tan naijati, tad dure, tad vantike, tad antarasya sarvasya, tadu sarvasya syabha yataha. Right. That he runs and he doesn't run. Right. And he is... Um, He's in. Uh, he's very close and he's very far, yeah, away. far away, and he's within everything and outside of everything. Right. So these apparently negative statements that people like uh, Koi and the, his teachers they misinterpret to mean that God is doesn't have a form. Actually, they're just so people um, clear up the misinterpretation of form. People think form means the form I have right now. Condition. This, this condition form, this crusty form that's going to fall away after now people only live to 100 years old. So after 100 years, this form, and while it's also going to the point of final destruction, it will change in so many ways. So people think this form, which is full of misery and it's temporary, is like God's form. But the Upanishads smash that and say, you know, he doesn't have any of these temporary, malleable, um, destructible forms. God's form is beyond anything material. But that doesn't mean that it's impersonal. It's spiritual form. It's uh, like Prabhu mentioned, this shloka from the Brahma Samhita, Satchitananda Vigraha. It's the form of eternity and bliss and knowledge. The complete opposite of material, but not impersonal. So you have to uh, take the Upanishads as they are. You can't just take a shloka here and a shloka there and pick and choose what you like and then make a, um, a conclusion based on that. Uh, like Arjun says to Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, I accept you in toto. So this is the way of understanding Vedas. This is a, a way of understanding God, that you have to accept ev all of the knowledge in total. It's not a, it's not a um, copy and paste thing and you make your own conclusion. You have to accept the authorized siddhantas, the authorized conclusions to understand God. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, so I think uh, this is this has been a sufficient uh, sufficient explanation of or a sufficient review of Koi's video. So uh, thank you, Koi Fresco, for doing a nice video on uh, Brahman and spirituality. We uh, very much appreciate your inputs. Uh, anything else you'd like to add, Prabhu? Oh, thank you for joining us on this episode of the Bliss Podcast. Um, if you would like to hear more subscribe and hit the like button like Koi Fresco nicely said in his video and uh, also if you'd like to um, help us out you can go on the GoFundMe and Patreon and give some donation there they'll be in the link below you're also entitled to a nice ebook compiled by Purajit Prabhu uh, there's some very nice ones on there uh, you can actually even get two that are in connection with this very podcast the um, history of atheism 
and teachings of Lord Buddha. Some very nice ones that you'll be entitled to. So, check it out. And if you're very good, you can get a third one Ooh. for free. Wow, okay, what, a, what an offer. Offered straight from Purdue himself. Amazing. Okay, cool. And if you become an Utama Level 1 Patreon, you also get a batch of cookies every month from Paramahamsa Prabhu's uh, Lotus Hands. He cooks these very nice cookies for Krishna and you get to taste them. Jay. Even I think of signing up for the Utama <laughs> Patreon. <laughs> Yeah, if we weren't so broke monks, we would also be on that cookie program. <laughs> okay, so um, join us next week for the next episode of the Bliss Podcast. You can put your suggestions for what you would like in the comment section below and tell us how you like this podcast and tell us how you like the previous podcast. Come on, open your mind. Reveal the mind. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, I think we have some outro music also that I really, it's very nectar to the ears. Jai Shri Prabhupada.